Day 872 of the Ukrainian war map, also known as the Russo-Ukrainian war. Juzzy here, and today is another update as I take a simplified and down-to-earth approach to some of the most important happenings on the ground in Ukraine. So starting off, we'll take a look at those Russian losses as currently Russia sits on more than 560,000 military personnel losses representing an additional 1,200 in the past day. Then as for hardware losses, 8 tanks, 15 APVs, 62 artillery, and 2 air defense systems. Then jumping straight to the map with a lot of activity in Russia today. Take for instance the Voronez region. Lisky Station, where a freight train derailed. There were no casualties and it was reported that 9 of the derailed cars of the freight train were carrying grain. But also to note, Liski is one of the hub stations through which the logistics of the Russian military takes place. Then right next door, because that event is not to be confused with another train derailment that occurred near the Lebdinsky mining and processing plant in Stary Oskol. No reasons were given for the accident. Which is interesting because train derailments sometimes have the ability to make international news headlines. And right here we have two in one day. Just another day in Russia, where the collective Russian mindset almost appears to be one of denial. But that's mostly due to the Kremlin's tight grip on the media and regional governments. So denial at the institutional level. Then right next door to Kursk, we might zoom right in for this one. As occurring at the same time as my upload from yesterday, Russian media reported a drone attack on a television tower in Suza with the addition of a substation, hit in Suza as well. Now, this Russian settlement is mere kilometers from the border with Ukraine, and if Russia was to perform a secondary northern incursion, this entry point would definitely be a contender for the Russian army. After all, there's only two main roads into Sumy from Kursk, so a Sumy incursion would be in close proximity to one of these two roads. And so, since Ukraine is expecting a new northern front by the Russian forces, perhaps the AFU is taking the approach of the best defense is a good offense. Then also in Russia, there was the reported case of another piece of debris from an unknown Ukrainian jet drone, as found at an unspecified location somewhere inside of Russia, which was then probably taken back to a Russian MOD department to marvel at the jet technology incorporated into a UAV. Then to the Krasnodar territory, with loud blasts reported as gas cylinders at Kalanino were reported overnight. The cause of the fire was not reported, and I venture a guess at this point that regional governments have realized that no news is good news when it comes to reporting to the Kremlin. Otherwise, they'll just face consequences for not aiding with their own local defenses. Something which the Kremlin has previously insisted that they do. Then to some Ukrainian map updates as the AFU has reclaimed territory north of Kharkiv, securing most of Heliboka along its northern fortifications. Though noting that the advances marked here are confirmations of earlier control with a more up-to-date map showing those recent actions. Then right next door at Vovchansk, Russian reports suggest that the Ukrainian armed forces crossed the bridge from the west with a counterattack. More confirmations are needed, and this news was followed by a Russian soldier posting to social media about some of the harrowing situations and losses faced by the Russian army, as he referred to issues faced by the Russian army in this urban area. And then also somewhere on the Kharkiv sector, we saw the accumulation of five Desert Cross 1000-3, aka Chinese golf buggies, just destroyed. And interesting fact, these buggies are worth approximately 20 to 25,000 US dollars, depending on their configuration, which I would expect to simply be $25,000 too much for the Russian forces. Which leads to the likelihood that Russia is burning a hole in its sovereign wealth fund, aka Russia's national wealth fund, where, last I checked, it lost about 40% of its wealth from pre-invasion levels. And that 40% loss was reported in November of 2023. I can only imagine what it looks like now. But as for the golf carts, this should not be happening for any professional army. Does anyone still think Russia is not running low on armored personnel vehicles, for instance? And there's no real mystery here. 
Russia is losing APVs quicker than they can resupply them. And I'm not just talking about new production, which is virtually non-existent anyway, but even the ability to extract them from old Soviet stockpiles to repair and send them out for. Because realistically, no one army or no sane person would choose an unprotected golf cart over an armoured personnel carrier. Let's just be realistic here. Then moving down on the map because the general staff of the Ukraine armed forces has stated that the battlefield situation near Turetsk and the Pokrovsk direction in the Donetsk Oblast is tense at the current juncture. Now the heaviest fighting is said to be concentrated in the Pokrovsk direction where Russian forces launched 35 attacks on Ukrainian positions within the past day alone. And as for Turetsk, Ukrainian forces repelled 12 attacks with fighting ongoing in three locations near Pivnichny and New York. And these areas, relatively calm since Russia's 2014 invasion, have seen increased Russian activity just since June. Noting that the 2014 invasion is signified on the map by the darker red or purple. And as of today, in the Turetsk direction, we did see a Ukrainian tank targeting occupier positions at a very short range. Then headed further south on the map as overnight an attack was reported at the military unit at Cape Fialent, just south of Sevastopol in occupied Crimea. And this is a known location for an anti-aircraft missile regiment, with sources suggesting it is likely that one of the radar stations was damaged, also with the mention of an explosion at the known S-400 position. Now, we await further confirmations on this front, but otherwise, seems so far that Russia was able to keep a tight lid on this one. Though later satellite imagery might put this one to rest. Then to the very edges of the Black Sea, because very recent satellite imagery from just yesterday has shown the naval piers at Novorossiysk are jam-packed. What an accumulation of Russian Black Sea Fleet naval vessels. 25 in total. Which would be impressive if they had the same capability to safely keep them positioned at the real Sevastopol headquarters. But even then, a naval fleet accumulation of this magnitude is risky given the modern day prevalence of air and naval drones. But then also, when taken within the broader context of occupied Crimean beaches with tetrapods installed, as you can see with the recent photo. So tetrapods are a type of coastal defense structure which serve as obstacles to hinder naval invasions. Yes, Russia is still quite paranoid about this at this point in time. And so in all of this, it doesn't exactly scream a Russian projection of power in the Black Sea, does it? Then taking a look around on the map as summer in the east, I'll start off with a bit of a change here today as most recently we saw the case of an undocumented loss from sometime in the past at Nova Mikhailivka on the eastern front lines, which is not surprising given the desolate wasteland of destroyed Russian hardware at that location. And with that in mind, we've now just come across this apocalyptic looking T-54 tank. So open source reporting counts this old Soviet tank as a loss now, but it really could have happened any time in, I'd say about the past three months. Then also in the east, soldiers of the 44th Artillery Brigade used a Shark UAV to locate and accurately destroy a Russian 2S5 Giant Sint S self-propelled howitzer. These Shark UAVs never outlived their usefulness and are equipped with high-resolution cameras with electro-optical systems that have algorithmic software geotagging capabilities, where they relay that data back to artillerists further afield. Impressive stuff. Then also in the east, we saw the epic detonation of a Russian TOS-1A short-range multiple launch rocket system, and I'd have to say, perhaps one of the last few we'll ever see taken out in the field. Russia had about 50 to 80 of these in total, and for a time, they were getting taken out once or even twice a week by the AFU. But unfortunately, due to their incredibly short range of 6 kilometers or about 3.8 miles, which makes them particularly vulnerable to drone strikes, the short-range FPV types, as was the case for this one here. Then headed across to some news for today, although this first piece is more of a Russian hardware news happening as we see more promotions of bonsai motorcycle assaults by Russians having come into the fray. They are taking it rather seriously. 
And with the introduction of the motorcycle now increasingly becoming part of the list of essential frontline vehicles for Russia, I project that at a time into the future, the Russian army may be known as the motorcycle army. Now apparently there is already some debate within Russian circles about whether or not to use electric motorcycles. That's an odd conversation to be happening, truly an odd suggestion. On a number of accounts. First of all, if you run out of charge, there's no infield infrastructure for it, particularly in a war zone. And even if there was, it'd likely take too long to charge. Not to mention the Russian MOD won't be forking out for the cost of a bunch of brand spanking new, but untested and expensive, off-road electric motorbikes. And as of so far, the Russian army is mostly depleting all of the available second-hand bikes as found in the occupied regions. Not exactly sustainable. No standardization with every single one being different. But given that they're cheap, and in this case, as you can see, can carry up to three guys, Russia may at some point repurpose some motorcycle factories and start to churn them out by the tens of thousands in order to keep this charade going. Hey, much cheaper than the golf carts. Though never mind the fact that a motorbike platform is completely devoid of any protection for the soldiers. But of course, this would be an afterthought as the Russian MOD doesn't hold life with great value. Then to another Russian military mobilization blunder segment of a type, as new data suggests a growing difficulty in recruiting new contract soldiers for the Russian army, prompting significant increases in signing bonuses across many regions. In April, most oblasts, including previously less affected hinterland areas, raised their bonuses, indicating either widespread recruitment challenges or increased quotas. Either way, it's not a great position to be in. And as you might expect, the Moscow region now offers the highest one-time payment of 1.7 million rubles, approximately 18,000 euros, for new contract soldiers. Additionally, 13 other regions in Russia are offering bonuses exceeding 1 million rubles. So these substantial financial incentives point to a potential shortage of willing recruits within Russia. And given we see these sign-up bonuses now, it's quite straightforward really. When supply goes down, prices go up. Supply and demand does not lie. All due to what is very likely a change in sentiment within Russia regarding the war, with an increase in perception locally that... Signing up with the Russian army is a veritable black hole for Russians who go to Ukraine. And this is just half the story because now with a labor workforce shortfall of 4.8 million workers in the country, the private workforce market is in fact directly competing with the Russian military for manpower now, which also has the side effect of inflation. It's just a complete mess that's getting harder and harder for the Kremlin to hide. Then, off to a super quick funny to round it off for today, guys. Bit of a sneaky one here, as Konstantin Zatulin, deputy of the State Duma from the United Russia Party, that's Putin's party, introduced a bill that would grant citizens of Belarus residing within Russia all electoral rights on par with Russians. And given the above-mentioned Russian manpower concerns, this super sleuth in the State Duma is likely implementing the granting of Belarusians the same electoral rights as Russians as a way to integrate them more closely into Russian society, which, I have a feeling, might have implications for various aspects of their participation in Russian affairs, including military service. At this stage, I wouldn't put anything past Russia. So that's it for today, guys. Thanks again for watching. Please continue to like and comment. Thanks again, once again, for all the support. And I do hope to see all of you guys there in the next one. Cheers.